it's uh, great to have, uh, I guess, Dr. Smale with us uh, tonight. And uh, I know there's others that could introduce him a whole lot better than I, Dr. Yoder and uh, Pastor, but he's not here, so you're stuck with me. Um, my, uh, my understanding is that, uh, uh, and feel free to uh, correct my pronunciation of your last name if it's, if it's not right, uh, but uh, my understanding is that Dr. Smale was... Uh, got saved in the age of nine, and uh, he and his wife met down here in Columbus. Uh, they're out in Canal Winchester, I guess. They're at Heritage, and he's the president of the uh, Independent Baptist Bible Institute. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, uh, in, uh, it's uh, from he's from Illyria currently. It's uh, great to have him tonight, and look forward to uh, hearing what you have for us from God's Word. Right. Pastor. Thank you for the read. He did a pretty good job on everything there. Uh, and he didn't have any cue cards either, so that's wonderful. Um, I, didn't, I didn't give him any of the information, so maybe he talked to his pastor. I'm not sure, but uh, it's a joy to be here and uh, be a part of the services here. I do pastor the Lake Avenue Baptist Church in downtown Elyria, Ohio, which most people have no clue even exists. And uh, most people can't even pronounce it, let alone know where it is. We're about a half hour to the west of Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, we're, we're kind of a bedroom community, I guess you'd call it. We're not quite into the, uh, the fix of being a suburb, but we're not far off of that, so uh, I'm glad to be a part of the service here. I, I have had the privilege of knowing your pastor for many years. We went to college together back in the days at Howes Anderson in the 80s, and, uh, but we didn't know each other real well then. And uh, because my home church is in Canal Winchester, the Heritage Baptist Church in Canal Winchester, uh, when I come in town, many times I've, I'm, I'm there if I'm in town. And uh, so I didn't always get a chance to come out and visit you, dear folks. And so to spend time with your pastor has been kind of a rare thing. But in the recent last couple of years, we've been able to uh, do so, my wife and I. Uh, my wife is actually at home in bed. Uh, which is not a good place for a pastor's wife on a Wednesday night. Uh, but she had surgery on her foot and had pins put in her foot, and so uh, she's under a, a strict orders to stay in bed, which she violates about every other hour. Uh, but uh, So she can't get around and walk around very much, or she'd be here. Several people have asked about that. Usually when I go somewhere, they do ask about my wife before me because she's my better half. So, uh, But anyway... Uh, so I'm glad to be here. I've got uh, two of my sons here. I've got lots of children. I think 11 is my last count, but it changes sometimes. Depends on who's spending the night or whatever. But uh, my son Weston is over here on the left side of the second row, and uh, he's 23 and uh, single. And uh, my son <laughs> Jonathan is on the right side. Are you 26 yet? Yeah, 26. And he has the same birthday I have, so I'm also 26 as Jonathan is. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, and he's also single, but they're zeroing in on some young ladies right now, so make your play tonight or you'll have no, <laughs> no hope for a play uh, in the future. This is, is, a, is the wireless on? Okay, good. I want to make sure I had it on. Uh, Brother Reed had made mention of uh, the college that I'm a part of. It's Independent Baptist Online College. And I'd asked your pastor if I could take a moment and talk about it just because of the fact that it's a college you can attend. Uh, it's for the ministry, but it's also for helping the people of God to grow and, uh, and to serve the Lord where they are. Uh, a lot of times, and we're not against a resident college. I was the vice president of a resident college in Dallas, Texas for several years. Uh, we're very much for that, but a lot of times people can't leave their home area or, or their church needs them, and uh, they can be uh, taking courses and even pursuing a, a degree online through the Independent Baptist Online College. So uh, it's easy to find. You just look at the letter I, ibaptistcollege.org, and you'll find it, and uh, all kinds of information there. You can audit classes. Right now we're having a summer school sale. Who wants to go to school in the summer, right? Uh, so we've got it drastically reduced, so you can go and take courses. But you purchase the courses. You take them in your time. Uh, you take it however long you want to take them. They're yours. Once you purchase them, they're yours. And so if you want to do them, binge take it and take it all at one time, you can do it. Or if you want to take it over the course of three or four months, you can do that, however you want to do it. If you want to pursue a degree, you can. If you just want to get some more Bible knowledge, you can. But you can continue serving the Lord in your church while you're doing it. It's one of the great assets of it. Plus the fact 
that it is taught, everybody who teaches there has at least 25 years of ministry experience uh, in, in their field. And so we've got, like for example, we have Dr. Tom Wallace, who is 88 years of age. He's teach, he teaches the, the book of Romans, and he's been in the ministry 68 years. And uh, we've got Dr. Jeff Owens teaching in our Bible college. We have Dr. Bob Gray Sr. teaching in our Bible college. These are men, uh, Brother Owens is not, but uh, Dr. Gray's in his 70s now. Uh, Dr. Les Hobbins, who uh, pastored many years in my hometown area, Temperance, Michigan, right on the Ohio-Michigan border, right above Toledo there, and, uh, and he's teaching in there. And so a lot of great men and ladies, uh, experienced people. So you're not going to get somebody who graduated last week, but you're going to get somebody who's proven it and shows how to do it. So check that out. It might be a help to you, and uh, you might know somebody that can be a help. And if I can be a help to guide you with that, I'd be glad to do that as well. Take your Bibles and go with me to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, and uh, we're thankful to be a part of your pastor and his wife's uh, friendship, and uh, you've got an outstanding pastor. And let me tell you one reason why I know that. One of, one of the reasons why I know that is not just that he's a good uh, uh, preacher or, or a Bible teacher, but the fact that he has never changed. We're in a day where everything shifts, and the doctrines, it's an amazing thing to me how that uh, we have a Savior, uh, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And yet everything about Jesus seems to be shifting everywhere you turn. And, uh, you know, your churches don't have services anymore. They change the names of their churches. They don't believe the book anymore. I mean, it just shifts and shifts and shifts. And uh, pretty soon, that's why Jesus made the statement in Luke chapter 18 and verse 8. He said, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Anybody going to be living this? Uh, when Jesus comes back, and I believe it's soon, is anybody going to be living this thing? Well, your pastor is leading you to live this, and he's doing a wonderful and an admirable job of doing exactly what he was taught in Bible college. And uh, I was in a conference just uh, yesterday and, and heard another man that I went to Bible college with, Dr. Mike Johnson, as he preached, and he's uh, been 30-some years in the state of California pastoring, Never change, never waver. That is an admirable trait. Our God is faithful. And the Bible tells us that faithfulness in our, our God as a part of his character means it's every time, not eight out of ten times or nine out of ten times, every time. So you can count on God to be exactly what he's promised he would be. Always. He's never, he doesn't have an emotional bad day. He doesn't have a, uh, a, a senior moment. Uh, which I'm starting to get more of. Uh, he doesn't have any weak, weakness in him. He's always the same. And uh, it's it is one of the greatest things that I love about the Lord is that he never changes. I like things that are the same, don't you? I like to eat at the same restaurants. I like to order the same things at the same restaurants. I like, and, and I got my friend Terry here, and uh, I've only got to play golf with him a couple times. He whips me too bad. I don't like to play with him. And uh, you'd think he'd be kind to preachers and, and help them, but no, no, he try, no he's an ex excellent golfer. I like to play on the same golf course because I'm not that good. I like things to be the same. And uh, so uh, I love that about the Lord. He's the same. And your pastor is that way. He's the same. And you old-time members, you know, you can, you, you can verify he doesn't change. And I like that about uh, Pastor Slabel. So I'm proud to be his friend and thankful for the opportunity to be here and uh, thank God for you. Is there any... Any barbers here tonight? Any barbers in the service? Raise your hand. I don't need a haircut. I was, I was really hit hard the last time I went to the barber shop. I ain't got much to deal with, so I, I can't afford to lose too much. But uh, uh, I heard the story of a barber who uh, decided he was going to give uh, every member of the clergy a free haircut. Every time they come in, they get a free haircut. You heard this story before? Uh, I think he was in uh, uh, Hilltop in Columbus or something. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he, so the, uh, he had a, a Catholic priest come in and sat in his barber chair, a chair and he cut his hair and uh, the priest got up off the chair and raised his gown to get to his wallet and, uh, and the barber said, no, no, uh, father, no, no clergy pays in my barber shop. Always free. Every haircut for clergy will be free now forever. So no, you don't pay. So the next morning the barber came to open up his barber shop and there was a, a bottle of wine and a thank you a card from the, uh, the, the father, from, uh, from uh, the priest. And that day he cut the hair of a Jewish rabbi. And uh, the Jewish rabbi had his hair cut when he got up uh, off the chair, went for his wallet to pay for the barber, 
And uh, the barber said, no, uh, Rabbi, all haircuts for clergy are free. You'll never pay when you come to my barber shop since you're part of the clergy. And the next morning, he came in to open his barber shop up, and there was a fresh-baked loaf of bread with a nice thank-you note from the rabbi. Well, that day, he cut the hair of a Baptist preacher. And uh, the preacher got off of the uh, chair there and went for his wallet after he had his hair cut. And, uh, and he said, no, Reverend, he said, uh, all clergy free haircuts in my barber shop. You'll never pay for a, a haircut in my barber shop. Uh, always free uh, for the clergy. And the next morning he came in to open his barber shop up, and there were 25 Baptist preachers waiting to get in and get their hair cut. So I'm one of them. I'm one of them. If I haven't told you, Lake, uh, Luke chapter 3, please, Luke chapter 3, if I haven't told you, if you have found it, stand with me. If you're one of the deacons like Brother Wallace, you haven't found it yet, just pick up a songbook and open that up and look intelligent. And, uh, you know, he's just the type of guy to pick on, isn't he? He's always, always smiling, and uh, somebody said something about his wife. I said, she's the troublemaker in the group, and I, I don't think I was very far off, but uh, I love the Wallaces, and what, what outstanding Christians, and people that love the Lord and win souls. And by the way, uh, even though you're retired, you can still win souls to Christ. There's, nothing, there's no expiration date on people getting saved, and so until you can't talk anymore, my mother-in-law led her grandson to the Lord on her deathbed. Uh, you can win souls. And uh, so I appreciate the Wallaces because they're very faithful people. Uh, Luke chapter 3 and verse number 15. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered and saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. Now, I have been seriously serving the Lord since 1978. Uh, longer than some of you in this room have been alive. I surrendered my life to serve the Lord, to live for Him in uh, May uh, 8th of 1978. And that is the day when I surrendered to start reading my Bible every day. And every morning I start my day, well, I get a shower first, then I get into the Bible, uh, the cup of coffee, and start reading God's Word. I can't not tell you how many times I have read this passage over the years and breeze through verse 15 like I did when I read it to you and, and just moved right past it as though it wasn't anything important, filler so-called uh, in the Bible. And as the people were in expectation and all men mused in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not. One day, as the Lord has a way of doing, he kind of hit me about that verse. And that's the thing that teaches us about how alive the Bible is, as the Bible is quick, alive, and uh, powerful, and sharper than two-edged sword, any two-edged sword. And uh, we know that to be true because we can still learn the Bible 40 years later. But that verse arrested my attention one day because of the phrase that says that all men mused, thought in their minds, thought in their heart, whether John were the Christ or not. I want to preach to you tonight on the subject, Mistaken for Jesus. And now, Father, help us in this Wednesday night as we've gathered for church. It's a good crowd for a summertime, a Wednesday service, and especially knowing that the pastor's away. Some people are not faithful when the pastor's not around, which is a shame, but these folks are. So I pray, Lord, that you would reward their faithfulness tonight and that you would give them what they need in their hearts and their lives. You'd inspire them, you'd encourage them, you'd direct them. If needed, you'd reprove them but help them to be different than they were when they came in in the things of God. And Holy Spirit of God, I yield for your power now. I pray you'd preach through me the words of life and help it to be carried forth as a vessel unto the finer that the people of God would be helped and the glory of God would be seen. Bless us together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Several years ago, there was a man in a far-off western state who had 
drawn the attention of uh, USA Today. He had been dressed in a Middle Eastern garment, wore a beard, had long hair, and he went about in several cities in this western state trying to do good to help people. If somebody was in trouble, he tried to help them. If somebody needed comfort, he tried to comfort them. If somebody was distressed, he tried to bring uh, uh, strength and help to them in their distress. But it bothered the authorities because of the way he looked and because of the fact that nobody seemed to know where this man came from. They didn't understand where he was from. They didn't hardly know his name. So the authorities sent some police officers to find him because of the fear that people had that maybe he had other ulterior motives in mind. Maybe he was a thief or a robber. Maybe he was someone trying to take advantage of somebody. And so they wanted to make sure what this man was all about. They finally caught up to this man in his Middle Eastern garments with his beard, his long hair, and they asked him, what is your name? So we can verify who you are and where you're from. And he says, who do I look like to you? And uh, one officer that was there in the group happened to be a saved, Bible-believing Christian, and he said, you're not who you think you are. And he said, well, who do you think I am? Well, you're not who you're thinking you are, he said, because you're not Jesus. He said, but I look like Jesus. He said, no, you don't look like Jesus. And he said, secondly, if you were Jesus, I would not be talking to you. Because the Bible says the next time I see Jesus, I will meet him in the clouds in the sky, and I will be forever with my Lord in heaven. And so you're not Jesus, and you're not the Savior. Well, we know he wasn't Jesus, but Jesus prophesied this. In Matthew 24 and verse 5, he said, Many shall come in my name and say, I am Christ. And all throughout the history of our world, there have been people who have tried to pawn themselves off as the Savior, as a false Christ, perhaps to get attention, perhaps for other ulterior motives, but uh, never being right. Because when you see Jesus again, if you're saved, when you see him, it'll be the twinkling of an eye, the trump of God sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord, and so shall we ever be. So you'll not see him on this earth again. You'll see him face to face. And what I love about that is it's as fast as you blink your eyes. And so I could be preaching and one moment later, I mean, blink your eyes and I'm not there. And if you're still seated here, you're in bad trouble because that means you're not saved. But I believe that Jesus talked it and taught it very well that there'll be some that'll be left behind. And even in church services, people that have said, Lord, Lord, open unto me. You taught in our synagogue. We've done many wonderful things in your name. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. I think it's got to be one of the saddest words that could be said of any time of our Savior that he never knew you. But if there was a day when you realize you're a sinner and realize that Jesus Christ paid for your sins and you from your heart trusted Jesus as your Savior, you became born again and you received Christ, he received you into his family. And so you don't have any worry other than the fact that you will stand before him and it could be very soon, even tonight. Now John the Baptist had not been in the ministry even 30 days when we read about this story here in Luke chapter number 3. And what amazes me in verse 15, as I had horse raced over this verse for dozens upon dozens upon dozens of time, in decades of time of reading the Bible, what amazed me when I stopped and paid attention is it says, and the people were in expectation, all men mused in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not. Now, I can give you some deep scholarly things if you'd like, I do have an earned doctorate. I can give you scholarly things if you want, but let's just talk about what does the word all mean. Be ready for it. I'm going to give you deep thoughts here. Uh, it, whether you want to talk about it in the Greek section of the New Testament or the Hebrew section of the Old Testament, the word all, here we go, in the Bible means all. And uh, that's as deep as you need for that. All men. Think about it. Young men, old men, uh, uh, black men, white men, uh, Hispanic men. All men were thinking in their minds, this was Jesus. Uh, I, I, they, 30 days. He's not 30 days of ministry. And they're thinking, this is Jesus. Now, 
What's really interesting to note about this is that in the 4,000 years that preceded this very incident, when you go back to the very first time there's a promise of a Savior, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, at the first sin of man, God promises that there would be a Savior coming from that point until the point we're reading about right here. No one at any time, at any place, had ever scripturally been likened to Jesus. Now think about it when you think about the characters who have trans, uh, transpired through the Bible before John the Baptist. Because in the first time in scriptural history, there was actually somebody who publicly showed the expectation of Jesus. No one had ever thought about Jesus being anybody else before. Here you have Abraham, the friend of God. Not one time does your Bible say somebody thought he was Jesus once. You have in your Bible, David, a man after God's own heart. And not one time does the scripture say David was thought to be the Savior. You have Moses, who God himself called Moses my servant. What a great title. My servant. And yet never in scripture is it said that Moses was the Savior, or thought to be the Savior, or imagined to be the Savior, or uh, even contemplated to be the Savior. Elijah and Jeremiah, two of the greatest preachers, these are men that I don't even belong to be in the same room with. And, uh, and, and these men were, were uh, 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 Jesus, when he asked his, his own apostles, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said of Jesus that he was like Elias, Elijah, or uh, Jeremiah, or John the Baptist, but they weren't talked about in the sense of being like Jesus. So isn't it an amazing thing that for the first time in recorded history, somebody has been given the tag of being like Jesus. That doesn't mean that there were others that were like Jesus. Obviously, these men were like Jesus, were like the Savior. But people, did, people who were lost didn't think that way. And of all the great things you could say about John the Baptist, I mean, he's the founder of our, of our group, man. Uh, this is the guy. This is the one we get our name from, our namesake. Of all the great things you could say about him, uh, the greatest you could say is that the people of his generation had mistaken him for Jesus. John, Jesus himself said of John, among women there's not risen a greater than John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 11. What an accolade for John the Baptist. And yet, could I ask you, could there be anything any greater said about any sinful man than you are Jesus? I'm not talking about somebody faking it. I'm not talking about somebody who's trying to get a name or trying to get money or trying to get some prestige or power from it. I'm talking about living a Christian life so much so that somebody thinks you're Jesus. It's not been done before, friend, until you get to John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3, just 30 days into his ministry. The great Baptist missionary William Carey, who, who was, was called God's plotter because he just faithfully served and faithfully worked in the mission field, and, uh, and if he failed, he got back up, and if he was having a bad day, he continued on, and if the things were against him, he still did the right thing, he didn't go by his emotions. He didn't go by his feelings. He plotted on his path of serving God. We call him the father of modern missions like we have today, like Brother Yoder and others that you support. But William Carey came back for a furlough into the States one day, and, uh, and in the days of uh, uh, where, where the, the media actually didn't have false news, they actually reported things that were true, and in those days they thought preachers were great men, and uh, they liked to, many times, would write the sermons of the D.O. Moody's and uh, Billy Sunday's and put them on the front page. Uh, William Carey came back, and, uh, and the press came to interview him. And they said, you are being compared, Mr. Carey, to the Apostle Paul for the great missionary work that he has done. You're compared to him. How do you feel about being compared to someone as great as the Apostle Paul? And a tear escaped the eye of William Carey, and he said, I don't want to be like Paul. I want to be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song, in the highway and among the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. And I serve notice on you, dear friends, of the Bible Baptist Church in Grove City, Ohio, that there is tonight no greater praise, no greater prize, no greater reward or honor that could be given to you, regardless of how it came about. Nothing as great as being mistaken for Jesus. 
We all long to have the praise of others. We long to be recognized by our peers and our fellow workers. We love to have the mountaintop experience, and yet no Pulitzer Prize holds a candle to this. No Emmy shines as bright as this. No Oscar comes close. No MVP trophy can be mentioned in the same breath as being mistaken for Jesus. Think of it, that someone would look at you, a sinful creature. Hey, there's nobody perfect in this room. I'll be the first one to tell you I'm not perfect. But every one of us were born of women, therefore we were born into sin, and sin came upon all men, for that all have sinned. There's that word again, that pesky word in the Greek, it's all, and it means everybody. Everybody here has grown up as a sinner. You needed to be saved. You needed a Savior because you are a sinner. And everyone, but to be told a sinful creature where our righteousness is as filthy rags that we could be mistaken for Jesus you can't get a better title than that. I mean, that is the greatest of all titles. How could I be considered anything like Jesus? Well, what did John the Baptist have that made them say that? It must have been something that happened with him that made them make this statement. Why would they say and think in their minds, you must be Jesus? I think you can find four things about John the Baptist that likens him to the thought process that they questioned whether he were Jesus. By the way, this isn't the only time they thought this, but this is the first time. First of all, what can we find out that, about John that made people wonder if he was Jesus and mistake him for Jesus? Number one, he was sent from God. That's the first thing. He was sent from God. Now, there's a, a very important word there. I say that on purpose because John 1, 6 tells us that he was sent from God. God. He was not sent by God. He was sent from God. It's not bad to be sent by God. You say, well, what's the difference? Is it just a, a, a word and, and you're saying one way, you know, half full, half empty? What is the difference between that? Well, the difference is if you are sent by somebody, they can send you from any location. But if you were sent from, you had to be in their presence. See, the Bible, that's why we, we, we have an all every word Bible. Uh, man should not live by bread alone, uh, <clears throat> Matthew 4, 4, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we've got an every word Bible. So every word matters. Every word matters. And he didn't say he, John was sent by God. No, no, God, and there's nothing wrong with that. I was sent by God, <laughs> you know, at different times. There's nothing wrong with that. Great, great men of God were sent by God. But it says on purpose he was sent from God. He had been with God. He had spent time with God. He knew God. And he was sent from him. My son, Brady, who is not here tonight, is, is assistant pastor in the church. And, and, uh, and I've been out of town. The last couple of weeks I've been out of town. I was in Delaware last week. And uh, so uh, I, I call him on the phone or text him. And, uh, and so and, and tell, give him things to do. I need you to do this. Today I told him I need you to take, we, we're, we're, we're putting a, a shed up on our property and we're putting up a, a picnic pavilion and we have to have permission from the city uh, to do it. It's called money making. And uh, they want to make some more money off of us. And uh, so he had a, a plot map and, uh, and had placed on it. I said, yeah, I need you to take it to the, the, the uh, city uh, area and have them do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling him what to do from my phone and he's doing it because he's being sent by me. When he goes there, he's representing me but I wasn't in his presence. We did it through text. We did it through phone. I sent him. He was sent by me. But from me means he's in my presence. <clears throat> he's seeing me. He's hearing me. He's a part of me. <clears throat> That's the difference. You know, I've been pastoring for 33 years now. And uh, can I tell you that I've had uh, college students. Well, when I went to college, and I'll tell you because I've talked to your pastor, when he went to college, it was the same thing. We went to Bible college, not because our pastor told us to go, but because God was working in our hearts. We couldn't resist it. He wanted it. He was calling us, and we had to fulfill what the calling, the gifts and calling of God. We had to fulfill it. We went to Bible college under that, and many who were there at Hiles Anderson, those 3,500 students in the days I was there, many of them were under that same calling of God. Nowadays, people send kids to Bible college because they don't know what to do with them. They don't have any trades. They're rebellious. 
And so what, get them out of the house. Send them to the Bible college. Let them reform them. And uh, that's not why. That's not how you do that. And so a lot of times, the Bible college kids go and come back, and they don't ever get anything. And they don't come back completed. They don't finish your course. Because they weren't sent from, they were sent by. I was sent from. Your pastor was sent from. We spent time with God. We had to know what is the will of God. There was fasting involved. There was prayer involved. There was surrender involved. And when you knew what God wanted, you came from God. Not just something, well, it'd be good if you just did that. It'd be nice if you did that. It'd be nice. It was burning inside. It's got to be done. You'll never be mistaken for Jesus if you won't spend time with him. Hey, listen to me. Nobody in this world will even consider you a Christian if you don't spend time with him. You've got to read your Bible. It's just, this is, we are in the last, last days. The stops are being pulled out by the devil, and every opportunity he can, he's going to try and waylay you, sneaking around and tempting you to do things. And if you're not in this book, you'll never make it all the way to the end. And I know you're not going to heaven because you make it to the end, but I'd like my testimony to match my salvation. I don't want to be a used-to-be Christian. I want to be still is Christian. And you won't, if you're not in this book, you will not get it. You've got to be on your knees, friend. You've got to be praying. This is the generation that is prayerless because we're not praying. We've got too much Facebook. We've got too much TV. We've got too much texting. We've got too many computers running. We've got music in both ears going nonstop all the time. We don't know how to be still and know that he's God. And yet you still have a Bible that tells you you're supposed to do that. You'll never be mistaken for Jesus if you cannot spend time with him. Never. We've got to do this. This is self-preservation. This is, hey, how do these churches keep shifting? Preacher, what is it with these churches? They keep changing all the time, and they drop names, and they get to change here and put rock groups up here, and uh, next thing you know, uh, the preacher uh, looks like a goofy uh, circus act, and, uh, and uh, cancel services, and eliminate, and quit teaching the Bible. And quit, what in the world's going on? Nobody's praying. Nobody's in their Bibles anymore. I'll guarantee you, if you're in this book here, you're not going to be getting out of church. You'll be getting in church. And can I remind you that Hebrews 10, 25 says, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, which, thank God, is Wednesday night for this church at 7 o'clock. But it says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you not believe Jesus is coming soon? Do you not see the day? Every Christian in this room sees the day. There was a day where preachers had to kind of prompt that because it wasn't so easy to spot out. And kind of, you know, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. Now, you have to be three fries short of a Happy Meal not to understand that. I mean it. you got rooms for rent and the, the doors are open and it's raining. I, you, there's no way you could be in your Bible and on your knees and not believe Jesus is coming. He's coming, friend. We need to be ready. Because what I would like for you to, to hear, as I say to my people on a regular basis, I want you to hear that, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou has been faithful, watch us in a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That's what you're hitting for. That's the home run right there. That's what you want to get. That's the accolade of accolades in heaven. To hear Jesus welcome you that way. It's what you need to do. But you can't do it if you're not faithful. And you can't be faithful without Bible and prayer or church. <laughs> this, listen, that's why I say, these, these, these guys say, well, we're thinking about canceling the Wednesday. This is a great Wednesday night crowd. Why would you want to cancel this service? Are you kidding me? Look how many people wouldn't have church. It's, it's too important. We don't need less church. This is not like drinking light beer. We need more. We need more of God in our life. We need more of the Spirit of God. We need more of the Bible. We need more fellowship. We need God. Last thing we need is start laying away and getting out of church, and, and we're not going to be better. We'll be worse Christians by getting out of church, and you're not going to get a You might get more people to show up on Sunday morning if you don't have Sunday night, but what do you have that shows up? Charles Spurgeon, back in the 1800s, said, the problem their generation faced is that the preachers were now entertaining goats instead of feeding sheep. That was in the 1800s. I can't imagine if he came back tonight what he'd say about our churches today. <clears throat> yeah, we're entertaining goats. We think it's great to have a whole church full of goats. Goats are not saved. Uh, the, the, the analogy is not saved. The sheep are the saved. Sheep hear his voice. The sheep follow him. The sheep are saved. That's the analogy. 
You'll never be mistaken if you don't spend time. You've got to walk with God. You need to be spirit-filled. We need, well, we don't even talk about the spirit-filled life no more. We're struggling so much with our feelings, our emotions, our time, and I know there's things that are involved in all that, but a lot of that would wash away if we just walked in the Spirit of God again. If we would yield ourselves to the Spirit of God, walk in the Spirit, and what? You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You won't do it. You can't coexist. So I've got to get in the Spirit, and I'll drive, I'll drive all those bad things, depression, anxiety. I'll drive them all out because I'm full of the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit cannot do those things. He cannot. He cannot be depressed. He cannot have anxiety. He cannot be bitter. He cannot be unforgiving. He cannot be angry. He can't. I've got to have him in my life. I'm just telling you tonight, why did they think that John was like Jesus? He came from God. He came from God. Now, I'm 59 years of age. My dad is 80, soon to be 81. And there have been times when I've been mistaken for my dad. Now, not in the age appearance. I know what you're thinking. You don't look 80. Uh, but there are things I do like my dad. I never, he never sat down and said, now, son, let me tell you something. I want you to talk like me. I want you to walk like me. I want you to do It's just things. I spent the first 18 years of my life with my dad. And he didn't teach me that. You just pick that up naturally just by being around him. So even my voice inflection sound a lot like my dad. And I've had fun doing this several times. I've been to my parents' house. They live just a, a little uh, to the west of Toledo, Ohio. And, uh, and so, and, and the phone will ring. I said, let me get it, Dad. And, uh, and my dad, when he answers the phone, always does this. He goes, yellow. You, you know anybody like that? They put a little Y there, yellow. <laughs> so, anyway, yellow. And Bruce? Yeah, how you doing, Bruce? That's my dad, Bruce. Yeah, I have to carry on a conversation for two or three minutes before they rise. You know, something sounds funny about you, Bruce. Well, it's not Bruce, it's Jeff, it's his son. <laughs> they think it's him. I was there this last uh, couple weeks ago, and, and uh, I just decided that I, I want to spend more time as much as I can. It's hard for me to do, but I like to spend more time with my parents because they're not going to be around long. And, uh, and so I'm trying to get out there and spend some time with them. But, um, but the phone rang, and, and my dad brought me, it was still ringing, and he brought me the phone, and here was my youngest brother on the phone. He lives in Florida. He said, let me answer it. Hello? Dad, yes. <laughs> How you doing, Dad? I, I'm fine. How are you, son? You know, carrying on this conversation. Two or three minutes, he's dead. Something sounds fine. Are you sick or something? No, it's not Dad. It's Jeff. What's wrong with you? I sound like him. I do things like him. I, my, my boys are here. My dad, you know, if you, if you started pouring your ketchup and it started coming real quick, I, he'd say, easy, easy, like that. You know what? I do the same thing. And uh, there's things. I don't, nobody sat there and told me to do that. I was from him. When you're from somebody, you take on the personality traits of that person. Have you ever read the story when Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain with, with the Lord? What happened when he came down off that mountain? Huh? His face shone, the Shekinah glory, was so, and he didn't even realize it. He, didn't, he just, you know, walking around, and everybody's like, oh, I can't even look at you. Now, we think that of somebody that's ugly. That's not what this was. This was the, the Shekinah glory of God. Really, he couldn't even realize. It's not, the, the people who walk with God don't, don't have this, oh, I know I'm walking with God. I'm really cool now because I'm walking with God. You don't know that's the case. It's what people see of you. John, John the Baptist didn't go around and say, hey, I, I am just like Jesus. No, they thought that of him. And Moses was so full of the Lord from spending time with him, just being with him. But they said, you've got to cover your face or we can't even talk to you. Man, that's a great testimony. How many Moseses have you seen recently? And I say, number one, why they thought John the Baptist was mistaken for Jesus. Why? He was sent from God. Number two, he preached Jesus' message. He preached the same message. Jesus, he didn't have a new message. It wasn't something different. He was preparing them. His job was to get them ready for Jesus to come. And so he'd say, you know, make your paths straight. Get everything in order in your life. Put it in order. Get things where it ought to be because Jesus is coming. But his whole life existence is Jesus. That's why we take this King James Bible and preach it. It's not about getting a, a, a circular or a quarterly and somebody's ideas and somebody's feelings. No, it's about getting the Bible and just taking God's word and preaching it and teaching it and loving it and helping people to know God through his word. That's what John the Baptist did. One time, somebody asked me, and I know what they meant by it. Uh, they, they, I was out soul winning, and, 
and I was introducing myself and the pastor of the church and inviting them to come to church. They said, well, let me, let me ask you, what type of preacher are you? And they said, are you a full gospel preacher? I said, look at me. Don't I look full? <laughs> I've lost 50 pounds in the last couple of years, but I, I, I look full still. I'm t- I'd like to lose another 25 pounds. I'd like somebody to look at me and say, Is, are you sick? Yes, I've lost weight. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm a full gospel preacher. Of course I am. What is this thing? Ah, well, you're a half gospel. No, no. The full gospel is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's as full as you can get. You can't get anything else. It's either you are or you aren't. John chapter 3 and verse 16, verse 18, and uh, verse 36. You either are or not. You're either saved or you're not saved. That's as full as you can get. You don't make any other place than that. It's full. You could stop a whole lot of nonsense in this religious world if we got back to being about Jesus. I mean, really, about Jesus instead of about how you feel, how your fr- family is, how you. Fr- and I know you got to teach a little bit about it, and I get it. But but tie it all to Jesus all the time. How is this tied to Jesus? That's the problem. <clears throat> when I was in Bible college, I was in the uh, jail ministry. Uh, now I've never been in the jail ministry from the inside. It was always on the outside. And, uh, and we come and we hold services as preacher boys, and we loved it because uh, we, we get a chance to preach. We'd have 250 uh, inmates. They called a captive crowd. And 250 inmates at the Cook County Jail in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, so we get to preach to them until we're on a rotation. And the guy who was the head, the, the student who was the head of our particular ministry, there were others who were heads of it, but he was the student head. And, uh, and he got up one day, and he said, uh, he said, uh, you know, all these hardened men, you know, men that are going to spend some time, you know. And he, he says to them, he says, men, he says, it's my turn to preach today. He says, I'm not going to preach to you. I'm going to tell you some stories about my life. And, he, and, and, you know, we're sitting down here, and he's telling stories about his childhood that were embarrassing. He told these men, these men, men in jail for crimes. He told these men that he sucked his thumb until he's 15 years of age. I wouldn't admit that. Why are you admitting that? He's telling these hardened criminals, these men in jail for committing crimes, he told them, I wet the bed until I was 16. Why would the world you tell somebody that? I mean, maybe it's true, but why would you say it? And it was just sad story after sad story after sad story after sad story. Well, when the service is over, we, we would get donuts from Dunkin' Donuts, and we'd, we'd give them out to the inmates as they leave just as a reward, I guess, for coming to church. Uh, but, uh, but one guy, i never forget, one guy took the donut, and he looked at us, us preacher boys, and he said, a hundred sad stories today and nothing for my soul. Now, you know, the thing about it is, that was the last church service that guy had for that week. He didn't have another church service to go to. It wasn't like we were coming back that night or anything else. And, and it, it, it made me remindful of the fact that every time I preach, it can't be sad stories only. It's got to be something for the soul. And Jesus is the king of the soul. He knows what the soul needs. And we've got to get Christ into this world. Hey, you want to know how to change the things that are happening in society? You've got to get Jesus involved in it. You can put laws out if you want, and you can try and externally t- change a country, but it won't change the problem. The problem's inside. They need Jesus. We've got to get preaching Jesus again. That's why they thought John the Baptist was Jesus. He preached the same message Jesus preached. The third thing about John the Baptist, why he was considered to be uh, mistaken for Jesus, he looked like what they thought Jesus would look like. Now, if you saw somebody and you thought, well, they don't look anything like I thought they would look like. Have you ever had that before? Somebody shows up and you think, man, I thought that they would be this, or they'd be bigger, or they'd be this or that, and uh, they're not anything like that. It throws you off. Obviously, John the Baptist was not so bizarre looking that when they saw him, they thought, this couldn't be Jesus. No, they thought he was Jesus. He had been mistaken. So he looked like what they thought Jesus should look like. Not like a 15th century artist whose paintings hang in the local Christian crook, I mean Christian bookstores. Not that. No, because first of all, they never saw Jesus. <clears throat> so they're not looking at a photo of Jesus. They're not uh, getting it off the online internet chat room. Uh, They have never seen Jesus. And their uh, artist's conception of what Jesus looked like. I will remind you that the scripture trumps what people think about what Jesus looked like. And what do we know about Jesus? We know that 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14 says, Does not nature itself 
teach you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. They said, well, what is long? Long is long. How do you feel? Well, I would imagine any man who has his hair down the middle of his back probably is under the category of long hair. I mean, that's just my, ca I, I would figure that. I don't think you can debate that issue very long on that. And uh, so for a, a picture of Jesus to have this perfectly manicured uh, nails and, and perfectly uh, uh, coiffed hair uh, and, uh, and, and, and look like he just got out from reading the blow dryer and, uh, and this almost effeminate looking creature is totally opposite of what your King James Bible teaches you. Totally opposite of that. That's not what the Bible teaches. And if that be true, then Jesus himself violated his own scripture. I remind you, if you want to go down that uh, a route and believe that Jesus violated scripture then how do you know you're even saved if he could violate any scripture then he could be a sinner like everybody else but yet he knew no sin the Bible says let's let God be true and every man a liar <clears throat> I worked in Bible college I worked in a funeral home and it was a great Bible job uh, Bible college job because I had a lot of time to spend and study and so forth and the 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 funeral director was very kind to help me and allow me time to study. But in, in the garage of the funeral home, there was one of those big pictures of Jesus, the long hair, the artist's conception of Jesus. And it was in there. And, uh, and I never said a word. I'm not a troublemaker. I, I, I maybe come across the pulpit like that way. But I, really, I'm not. Personally, I'm not. I'm, a real, I'm really a nice guy. I said I'm a nice guy. <laughs> so... Uh, so I never said anything about it. And the, the funeral director, he was what I call a chameleon Christian. He was whatever the people were that he was serving. If they were Catholic, he was Catholic. And he did all the, all the signs of the cross and the crucifix and all that. And if they were Jewish, he was Jewish. And if they were Muslim, he was Muslim. I mean, he was whatever they were. He never had any stands of his own. It's just whatever they were. And uh, that's how you sell caskets and things. But anyway, he, uh, he said, uh, 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 we're, we're walking. I was walking next to him. We were walking to the garage one day. And he stopped in front of that big picture of Jesus. I mean, it's a big thing. And he said, you don't like this picture, do you? I never said a word to him. Never said a word to him. And uh, I said, no. And he said, why don't you like this picture? I said, because that's not how Jesus looked. He says, how do you know? I said, and I quoted the same verse I quoted you from 1 Corinthians 11. I said, it can't be Jesus because that guy's got longer hair than my wife has. It can't be Jesus. <clears throat> this is what he said. He said, can't we just pretend it's Jesus? I said, well, how about we do this then? How about we put a picture of Pee Wee Herman on here and say it's you? Would that be okay if we do that? Now, <clears throat> the people that are closer to my age laughing right now, the younger people are saying, who? <laughs> who? <laughs> I said it. We have forgotten this truth in our modernized generation that longs to fit into this world. Here's a news flash. We're not supposed to fit in. We're not supposed to fit in. We are supposed to be peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. We're not supposed to fit in. So while people are spending their time, listen, nothing grieves me more than these preachers keep downsizing themselves so they can fit into the crowd. I, I, I don't think I'm better than you, but I have a position that's called of God. And that, that, that you, you know, I'll fight for, the, I won't fight you for who I am, but I'll fight you for the position I have and hold. It came from God. And uh, so therefore, I'm just like, I sat in a pew one day. I was a layman like you. God called me out of that group to lead. That's what he called. He doesn't call everybody, but he gives you all a position and all a job and all gifts of the Spirit. And there's something for you to do for God. But I'm just saying, it's not that I think I'm something or feel like I should be, but I'm not supposed to fit into this world. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me at heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I don't feel at home in this world. Put me in the mall, I feel like a duck out of water. I don't feel at home in the mall. I don't feel at home in the restaurant until the food shows up. I don't, I don't feel at home in crowds. I feel at home in church. And having a church on home road, what a blessing that is. Good night. You can't get much better than that, other than heaven road, maybe. Uh, I got these young preacher boys. And we have 1,120 students right now. And I got some of these young preacher boys and, and teach them. I say, listen, <clears throat> you're a man of God. If you're called of God, you're a man of God. Start acting like one now. 
you know what? There's no switches that turn off when you get your, your sheepskin, your, your diploma, and all of a sudden, now you're a man of God. Hit the switch and do, do the work. No, no, you're a man of God. You were called of God now. So look like you are. Act like, talk like you are. Do the things a man of God does. Well, I want to be like everybody. You're not like everybody else. Sorry. That's not the, that's not the will of God for your life. You're not like everybody else. So, uh, you know, you, I, I'm not going to show up in my pulpit on Sunday with, uh, you know, a pair of whole jeans in it and a, and a, and a power shirt on and, you know, and uh, sit and talk on a bar stool f- for 15 minutes and t- tickle your ears about how good you are. That's not what I'm called to do. Nor is anybody else called to do that. Those are what the Bible calls, hold on, hirelings. They make money off of it. That's their job. They make money. That's their, that's their, they're like welders and, and carpenters, and these are the, the, the new preachers. No, no sir. <clears throat> if you should uh, see your pastor looking like that, you call and tell me that. You know better than that. He's a man of God. Why did they think John the Baptist was Jesus? He looked like what they thought Jesus should look like. If you want ever to be take, taken in that way seriously, you can start looking more like Jesus, like the Bible requires us to be. And yes, the Bible does require us to look a certain way and do a certain thing. It's what we are supposed to be. Amen. We're Christians. We are salt and light into a dark world that is tasteless. We're supposed to make a difference. Why are we constantly following the fads? We, we, we long to follow all the fads. What is the world doing? Is it okay to do? Good, then I'll do it with them. Why? You are supposed to be the leaders. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. He looked like what Jesus looked like. Here's the last one. But don't put your Bibles away. You never can tell what the Spirit of God does. He worked like Jesus worked. John the Baptist was far from lazy. His whole life, think about it, was given to serving others. We are never told of one thing he does for himself. Never do we know what Jesus did for himself. What did Jesus do? Well, I'm sure he had to, you know, uh, uh, wash his face and, and things. I'm sure he had to do some things like that. But his life wasn't about him. It was never about him. John the Baptist wasn't about him. His concern was always on others. You will never be any more Christ-like than you are by what you do for others. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, <clears throat> which, we, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of the greatest of the great. Oh, wait a minute. That's not what that says. The form of, there it is, servant. Servant. The thing that nobody wants to do. Serve. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody likes doing it, and nobody likes the title. And yet, what did Jesus say? The greatest of these is the servant. You want to be chief? Be the servant. That's how you are. That's why verse 4 prefaced this saying uh, in Philippians chapter 2 by saying, Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Lord, help me live day by day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live like thee. It's always about somebody else. Can I, can I help you with this? When you come to the Bible Baptist Church, you should click it here into ministry and instead of coming and say, who's going to talk to me? Who's going to make me feel good? Who's going to be my friend? Who's going to help me? How, how can the preacher help me? Come in and say, who can I help? Who can I be? How can I encourage my preacher as he's preaching? How can I help somebody? Is there somebody that's by themselves, a visitor? Can I sit by them? Is there somebody that I know is hurting? Can I come by them and encourage them? Hey, listen, people come to church for lots of reasons, but one reason is because they want to get help. They want to get help. And sometimes the people that look the worst are needing the greatest help. And so often we just push them aside and we just, well, I got my comfort zone. I've got my clique I spend around. These are my friends, and we'll go out to eat, and we'll have a great time, and the world comes for help from God's people, and there is none. Why? We're not about others. We're not about others. And our Savior was all about others, and our namesake, John the Baptist, was about others. That's why they thought he was like Jesus. He was all about others. Now, I'll let you on a clue tonight, because you don't know me very well. I didn't first get this from the Bible. I know it's from the Bible. I read it to you. 
I didn't first learn others from the Bible. I didn't first learn others from Bible college. I didn't first learn others from my pastor or from Dr. Jack Hiles when I was in Bible college. I didn't learn that then. I learned it first from my wife. I don't know anyone who concerns themselves more on others than my wife does. She's always about somebody else. And here, you know, here we are coming into the days where we're getting close to retirement age, whatever that age is. And, uh, and, and yet it's still about somebody other than her. It's all about somebody else. When I met her, she was a bus captain in downtown Columbus in our home church being in Canal Winchester. And, uh, and she was a bus captain before I met her. She was several years as a bus captain. But she was not just a bus captain, went out on Saturday and visited for an hour, hour and a half, and then came in on Sunday. And uh, no, she was somebody who, she many times go out on Monday night and she'd take groceries to a family in need. Or go out there on, on Tuesday night and uh, I, uh, she'd take a Christmas tree to somebody at Christmas time, didn't have a Christmas tree. Uh, or she'd go Thursday night and uh, be by the bedside of someone who was uh, sick. Uh, there was a man on our bus route. Uh, uh, his name was Bill Smith. Bill was blind, and, uh, and he couldn't care for his, his, his house or his life, and uh, she would go once a week and uh, take a, a, uh, a vacuum cleaner into that house, and she would clean his house for him. Nobody would come and take care of Bill. Nobody cared about Bill and what was going on in his life. He never one time went to our church, never darkened the door of that church, and yet every week here she'd come, bring a vacuum cleaner, bring cleaning supplies, she'd uh, clean his toilets, clean his sink out, out vacuum, and, 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 you know, vacuum roaches up. I wasn't a, a clean, you can imagine, well, how could it be a clean house? You couldn't even see anything. There was nothing there. Nobody cared for him. Nobody did, but she did, and nobody knew about it. Why? It's about others. It's not about you and I. It's about somebody other than us. Listen, the greatest day of your life is when you get off of you and get on to somebody else. Because it's somebody else that needs you, and you have something they need. Your love, your friendship, your kindness, your teaching, your knowledge, your care. That's what they need. And many times people slip in and slip out of a church and never get the help they need because nobody cares for others. It's all about what can you do for me. And why do people choose churches? What does the church do for me? And that's why the no-name generic megachurches are so big today. It's all what I can get out of it. So give me church. Give me something else. Give me something else. Where's the service at? I'm not, I, I have no problem with the church running 10,000. Love to have 10,000 in the church. But what could I do with 10,000 people if I could mobilize them for others? And tell me about how big your church is if they're not doing anything. You, you got a bunch of goats you're entertaining. That's all you're doing. Get them out there and mobilize them for a world that's dying and needs Jesus in their life and they need love. Nobody cares for them. How sad that is. And people that are sitting in this room are thinking, Nobody cares for me either. The great David wrote in Psalm 142, he looked on his right hand, looked on his left hand, refuge failed him, no man cared for my soul. How sad that could be. And yet we live in America and we say, well, there's so many government programs. It's not the government's job to care for people. Well, there's so many ways that people can get food. It's not their, their job. There's so many ways they can get help. It's not their job. It's become their job because the church quit doing its job. Amen. Why did they think of Jesus, uh, John the Baptist being Jesus? Because they saw him, they heard him, they watched him, and they mused in his heart to whether he was the Christ or not. He was mistaken for Jesus. Anybody ever mistake you for Jesus? I, I tell you the truth, I've never heard nobody think I'm Jesus. But at least the few times I've been witnessed to in my life, when they witnessed to me and I told them I was saved, they said, I figured that. I was graduating from Bible college. I had a, a, a newspaper route, a motor route. Couldn't get a job for nothing. I was at a bad time in the 80s, depressed area. And, uh, and I took a motor route. I was delivering newspapers from my car just to get through Bible college. And um, I stopped at a place that I always just put the paper in the box and, and took off and left. Never met the people. And I was putting the paper in the box, and the lady was on the porch waving at me. Come here, come here, come here. And I got out of my car and went up to the door, and she said, listen, she said, we're moving. You need to cancel the paper for us and send us a bill, and, and we'll go ahead and pay what we owe. And uh, I said, okay, and I wrote their name down. And she said, before you leave, she said, I need to ask you this question. Now, I'm in Bible college studying for the ministry. She said, if you were to die right now, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. I said, I've known since I was nine years of age. She said, how do you know that? I said, I trust that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I'm going to heaven. She said, well, you know what? I thought that was true. In fact, I told my husband, he's already saved. 
And he said, well, it ain't going to make no difference to him if you witness to him. You just make sure. She said, I thought you were already saved. I said, how do you, now, wa- now watch this. Oh, I just delivered the paper to your house in a car. I didn't ever get out. This is the first time I ever got out. I never even met this lady. How do you think I'm like Jesus? You just look like the Lord when you walk by, you drove by. Do you know people are watching you all the time? They're watching you at the stores, the malls, and they know that you belong to Jesus. They really watch you now. They got their eyes on you and wondering, what is this creature all about? Wouldn't it be great if when they looked at you, they saw something of the image of Christ? Let's be people who are mistaken for Jesus. Father, help us with this tonight. The truth of the matter is, I know I can preach this message in this church because I believe the people of this church as a whole want this same tribute. They want to be mistaken for Jesus. I think the people that come on a Wednesday night to the Bible Baptist Church, they're not doing it because they just have to do it and somebody's going to force them to do it. In fact, the pastor's not even here. He's on vacation. They could have snuck out. They came because they want to be like you. I think it's the greatest testimony ever if we could be like you. Would you help us, Lord? Help us to spend time with you every day. That when we walk with you, it just resonates. People see that Shekinah glory from spending time with you. Help us that the things that we do would resonate that. That we'd serve you and all be about others. Help us to be in our appearance be more Christian, Christ-like than world-like. So people would see Jesus. Help our message to be Jesus. Everywhere we go, let us encourage people with Jesus. Help us, Lord. We want to show the great glory of God from ourselves. Bless us tonight for Jesus' sake. Our heads are about our eyes are closed. I don't know many of you, so let me just ask, if you're here without Jesus, would you not leave without him? There are men and women in this church that could take a Bible and show you from the Bible how to go to heaven. It's not Baptist theology, it's Bible truth. And you can know today, regardless of your background, where you come from, how old you are, and maybe if you've been coming here a long time, maybe you've realize hey that's true about jesus he could come any moment would you really be left behind if you're not saved you will be you can be saved tonight you come forward just a moment and we'll have somebody help you and show you from the bible you can know this today so if you're saved here do you really want to be mistaken for jesus what could be a greater way so oh, i'd love to have a, a doctor's title i'd love to have an mvp trophy i'd love to be uh, the next uh, american idol uh, those are nothing compared to what being mistaken for jesus is Why don't we come to the altar and ask the Lord to help us to be like Jesus. Let the world see Jesus through us.